Well, hello everybody. Um, my name is JK. I've been uh, a teacher in the building. I think this is my 12th year. Um, and I was asked by our administration just to facilitate this evening's community forum. Um, so I've crafted a little agenda up here for folks to follow. We're gonna talk about some discussion norms as we hear from our student panel. There'll be four rounds of student voices. Um, we have four rounds of questions for them to consider and uh, share their reflections on their experience as students here in the building. Then we'll open it up to community questions and answers from our student panel, uh, and hopefully work together to frame some action steps moving forward. Um, so I have some discussion <coughs> norms just to review for everybody. Obviously we want to practice one voice at a time, especially as our, our student volunteers are here. We'll practice good eye contact. Um, we'll disagree with ideas, not with people. Um, hopefully and ideally supporting our ideas with evidence of our lived experience as we share our stories. Um, and then the asking questions is built right into our agenda today. So approaching the conversation tonight with curiosity um, so that we can learn more about safe environments for our school and uh, or for our students to be in. Um, so again, I'm JK. First round, actually let's uh, now introduce our student panels. Hi, I'm Layla. Uh, I'm Sierra. Uh, how about your year oh. in school? I'm a 12th grader and I'm a junior. Um, and I think how many students were actually asked to participate and like two dozen or yes. so. Um, and as we see from trying to find parking in the building or around the <coughs> building this evening, there are competing events uh, vying for our students' attention. So we are so thankful to have your voices here. Thank you for joining us today, Leila and Sierra. Um, okay. So we're going to get right into the rounds, um, and the first one we're going to, you know, do a little compliment sandwich here. So we're going to start off with some positives. Uh, currently, what do you think feels really positive about the RU school community? What feels safe? Do I go first? Uh, I can go first. Um, I feel like currently, uh, some of the things that feel very positive are like I think for one, campus life uh, run by Layla, <laughs> as Layla's the president. I think is a good way like to get students involved in like the school. Um, there's like fun mini games throughout the week this week about of course pieing teachers. Um, and I feel like that was a good way to like get people to sort of you know agree on something and like be in community around something. Um, I think that was really good. Uh, I think also like some other classes, um, especially sort of like the smaller classes where it's more of like a community class like for example like racial justice you know there's a group of us uh, we're all there for the same reason we all want to be there and so that feels just like a very good sort of community to have around um, so like those types of types of groups too like um, like little smaller communities within the school I think like extracurriculars theater that type of stuff can I just ask I think with your mask it's kind of hard to hear so maybe if you talked louder or okay slower or something I'm sorry but, no worries, yeah. and it is a common thing with mm -hmm. masks <laughs> thank you for asking um, I'd say campus life I'd agree with you for, with that I think that um, with campus life we've seen a lot more community within the school I know the first spirit week that we had was the week we came back to school after the news outbreak happened and it was really hard but I think would you mind just describing campus life for oh. everybody, what it is, and yeah, your sorry. project too, so it, it um, could be helpful to hear that. Yeah, so my senior project is campus life. It's basically planning spirit weeks, prep rallies, dances, and anything that has to do with student involvement out of school and within school to kind of make the environment here more exciting and um, more enjoyable and something to look forward to. With campus life, my main goal was to keep it here and to keep students happy. So I think that the positive with that is that it was right after um, the news outbreak and it was very nice to see people happy um, and to not see people mad. Like when we did the tunnel during the prep rally for students get called out not by name, but by sport, and they run out through a tunnel to kind of celebrate fall athletes. The girls' volleyball team was there, and we worked together 
and this is another positive, that we can work together as students and teachers to make up plans that we both like to incorporate into our spirit weeks and prep rallies. So I go to JK and I go to Bet and I'm like, what can we do? Because I don't want to call out names and have an outlash or a backlash towards certain names that are called out. And it was, let's just not call names. That's how easy it was. And I think that's a really good positive is just being able to, you know, talk with teachers and be like, hey, like this is not really working well. Can we fix this? And I think that's a really good thing that we have here as RU is just there's so many teachers and not so, so many students. So we're able to like go one on one and talk to teachers one on one, either if it's about grades, if it's about planning, you know, our school, our schedule or, you know, being like, hey, Mr. Kelman, like my, the class isn't really doing it for me. Like, what can I do better? Or what can we do to incorporate something more, not fun, but more like hands on because that's how I learn. And you're able to like make those lessons with the teachers and, you know, put that positive stuff out with them and work together. Um, awesome, thanks ladies. Uh, what I was just gonna offer, and because I saw Sierra jotting some notes down, um, the little handout, and just for clarity, maybe also for anyone who could be uh, like streaming the forum, is a tool I use in the classroom, but also one that I'm asking community members to consider tonight, which is what I call mental mapping. Um, so it's basically a space where what can sometimes feel very vulnerable and unsafe, even something as simple as like a silly question that's like, what's your favorite pizza topping? And Layla says, mushrooms. And Sarah's like, mushrooms are disgusting. It's like, okay, you know, like we don't need to have like such, you know, outbursts about mushrooms, it doesn't matter, right? So uh, instead, students who have strong feelings about pizza toppings or anything, have a place to land those thoughts. So some people might be writing down mushrooms as like, that is my favorite, also same, that's my favorite topping too. And um, it provides room for Sierra to disagree and say exact opposite view, hate mushrooms, fine. Um, someone has never heard of mushrooms before. So they could mentally map that in the brand new column and the way that Layla is describing the mushrooms on her pizza, I've heard of mushrooms before, but I thought about canned mushrooms. These are fresh mushrooms. I am thinking about these in a brand new way. It's not a new idea, but I'm thinking about them totally differently. This is a place for us to just land our thoughts and just to uh, you know, ground the conversation and reactions as they might come up. Um, so I saw you using that tool. I wanted to explain it for transparency, just as like a guide. Um, before we head into our next question, which is gonna turn the conversation around a little bit. Um, and so I think it's really important too, as the community is listening to this, the students respond to the next question, that they think about like their percep perceptions of the school and what the students are offering and like where the student and what they share lands on the mental map for them as we head into this next question. Um, JK David has a question. Yeah, go ahead. Do you want Q&A in between each round, or do you want us to hold our questions to the end of these four? That's a great question. Maybe it feels like uh, per round. Maybe it makes more sense just so it feels relevant so and we can okay. not lose our tra train of thought. Is now yeah. okay to ask questions about this round? Sure. Okay. Yeah. My first question is, um, is there a succession plan for Layla's position? for next year, the year after? Yes, there is. Right now, as vice president, we have Shiloh Lake. She's a very big member in our community. She's captain of the varsity girls basketball team, captain of the varsity girls softball team, and she does camp counseling. She's a huge member of the community. And we have Sierra as you know her second up. Uh, we also have Adrienne, which is also an 11th grader, and Ryan. Um, so we have many for next year who would love to be president. We also, for the year after that, we have a lot of 10th graders, and we do have one 9th grader who would love to become president. So I do have a succession plan. We're doing fundraising right now to kind of keep that plan in place and keep these things going on. Um, but yeah, there Great. is a succession plan. Thank you. So it's more, it's more like a club. It's not just you and your senior project. It sounds like you made a club that's going to be sustainable. Yes. <laughs> that's, Thank you. Yeah. That's it for me. 
Great. Any other questions about the stuff that the students shared are going really well right now? Positive things. I just wanted to compliment you on recognizing that if you called people's names, you might get that response that would be negative because I think I think of myself at your age, I would never have heard that. <laughs> now, granted, that was when we were dinosaurs, just a little <laughs> steps us. So a lot of it's changed, but really, I'm still complimenting people. <laughs> Great, we'll head into round two. So for the second question, what feels hard and unsafe and less positive at RU right now? Do you want to start it or do you want to start this one? <laughs> okay, um, so I'm trying to like think of like how to organize it. I think um, one thing that I've like seen a lot and heard a lot from students is when like other students are making them feel unsafe um, there's not really a lot done about it, and it continues to still be an environment that they do not want to be in, um, because these things keep happening over and over again. Um, I think that's a big one. It's just like not enough is being done. Um, for that, I think, in addition, uh, just like, I feel like there's just sort of like a lack of awareness surrounding a bunch of things in the school. Um, and that's something I think we're hoping to fix. I think that's something Lord, that's something we are working on in racial justice is like how to bring more awareness to a bunch of different topics that people don't know about, causing um, these things, these like um, things to keep happening, and or if teachers are not able to intervene because they don't know that something is not like that's that shouldn't be happening. Like they don't recognize that as like. Um, like an act of oppression towards somebody, and so they aren't doing anything about it, and that's something we want to change. Um, and I feel like the other thing is maybe there's like sort of a lack of communication between like um, like higher admin, like the school board or superintendent, just like about some things or like policies they're creating that will directly affect students. Um, like we don't like there was there's talk of an equity policy starting to be put in place. And I only found out about it like that, like this is a process that's starting from like a couple other people and I had no idea because there wasn't a way that it was like broadcast to people. And so I think making sure like students have input on things would be good because not having that input like is make it makes students uneasy because there's all these decisions being made about them that they don't have any control over. That's all. Yeah, and I agree with you. We are working on microaggressions in racial justice. Um, things that are just normal, everyday things that people who aren't very, that aren't educated on the topic. So saying things towards, say you see a BIPOC student and you love their hair. It's not my hair texture, it's not Sierra's. And you go up to touch it, like without asking. That's obviously a microaggression that we're not supposed to do. And you might not see it as a microaggression because you're just not educated on it yet. And so I think that what we can do in the school community is really start teaching about these little nitpicky things that students feel unsafe for. Um, personally for me, I've been told by a teacher <coughs> that my exotic babies would be amazing to bring back to RU. Um, I don't know the teacher's name. I don't really know a lot of teachers here, but I was walking the hallways with my boyfriend Pablo and I was told that to my face and it's like a what does that mean your exotic baby <laughs> oh yeah so <laughs> um, my boyfriend Pablo is a Mexican man so what they meant by exotic babies was bringing like it's a stereotype towards Latin American people like oh you're so exotic because you're not white and you're from somewhere different yeah. So just little things like that around the school, like I've heard so much little things that just add up. There's teachers that have said, oh, I know you know how to salsa. Oh, I bet you like tacos. And you know, it's, it's, it's just stereotypes that people just aren't taught about. I don't think that it's just, I don't think that they're racist and I don't dislike the teachers for it. I do think that they need to be educated and I think that that's the raw and the root of the problem in a lot of these situations is that teachers and students are educated enough on this stuff because we don't have a lot of BIPOC students to educate the teachers and be like, that's wrong. And we don't, and you know, all, I'm white, Sierra's white, a lot of us, all of us in here are white, right? And it's hard for a white person to teach another white person about BIPOC issues because I know about BIPOC issues, but I don't know BIPOC issues in myself. 
So it's really hard to teach that. And like Sierra said about discipline, I do think that discipline is really, I don't think it's at its best in this school. I think that it's hard to discipline kids and when you have a very small community because one thing goes wrong and just everything goes wrong. And it's, it, or you tell a kid no and they're like, I'm just gonna walk out then, and they walk out. Like I've seen that before. And I really do think it's not the teacher's fault and it's not admin's fault. I really think that we as students and we as a community need to start putting down these boundaries first and start telling teachers, this is how you discipline a kid without crossing the line. Because if you look at it from like a point of view, um, I'm not from here, I'm from Georgia. Discipline in Georgia is a lot different from discipline year. We had ISS, OSS, we had pink slips. If you get too many, it was a lot of stuff that we, they had in place, that teachers had in place, that we were all taught about from day one in school. We read through the handbooks all together in advisory. We knew what the disciplines and the consequences were. And I think that's what we need in this equity policy is we need a fine line between what's right and wrong and a fine line between what, how do you get in school suspension and how, what is the difference between just talking back to a teacher and you know, walking out of the classroom and being like, F you, you know, out of nowhere. Um, and I think that's, do, I do agree with Sierra, is that what, that's what we need, is we need more discipline for kids who don't understand or that act out. And we need, while they're, we're disciplining them, I think they need to be taught that certain things that they say aren't okay. Like if you're vividly or outwardly racist to someone, you should not only be disciplined for that because towards one student, because that's bullying either way, but you need to be taught like, this is why this is bad. And we're not just telling you this is bad because the other student feels bad about it. Like, look at it from this way. And maybe students would, you know, we'd be a more tight-knit community that way. And I think just sort of add something about, like, the discipline um, is, like, just it sort of just sort of, like, goes across the board. And what students kind of, like, see, like, as a student, I see, like, things, or, like, students saying things, doing things, and then I see them, like, get called to the office, get called to have a meeting with a teacher, or go talk to some other adult, and then two days later they're doing the same thing over and over again. And it's just like, the, as a student, you're like, okay, you're trying to like make this safer for the students around you, but like it's not working. So I think like, we need to figure out what's not working, because something isn't. Great. Are there any questions from community members regarding some of the things that the students share? Um, well, first, I just want to say I share some of your feedback. I've heard the need for more discipline, not just to make people feel safer in the classrooms, but it's also a distraction from your learning and the academics. So I'm glad you brought that up. My question is I had heard about a policy around like a way to anonymous, anonymously report microaggressions um, or, or maybe they're not even microaggressions. And I'm just curious from your perspective, it has been using that? Has students been using that? Is, is it effective? Is it too soon to know? Is it worth keeping in place? I just don't know a lot about it. I knew it was something relatively new this year. Um, personally, I don't think people use it because I think um, put your shoes into a person that's being bullied and you talk and you know that this person has been bullying you and maybe you've brought it up and it just hasn't been fixed. Anonymous is really hard because that can get sent, in, it, not just for students, but for teachers and for people who are investigating it. Um, personally, I had an investigation and it's multiple steps. It's not just, you know, oh, this happened. It's multiple steps of going through, mo asking multiple times, what happened? Are you sure this happened? And then coming back together. And I think as anonymous, it's really hard for administration and for investigators to really get into what happened because it is anonymous. So how, like if they don't do names, or they don't say names, and they're just like, this person's been bullying me, this is what they said. How do they know it's true to a certain extent because it's online? And anyone could say that. Like I can go on and be like, Sierra just bullied me right now in front of everybody. But they don't know me, and they don't know you guys. Like, they, they can't prove that, and they can't get in Sierra in trouble for that. So I think the anonymous, it works In my opinion, I don't think it will work in the future because of 
the lack of evidence that it has for investigating towards bullying and investigating through our bullying policy. Yeah, I think there's definitely something to be said about, like, you know, a student can say something happened, but then, like, if that doesn't give enough information, that student's not comfortable, like, fully coming forward, or, like, if that student doesn't put a name down, then nothing really gets done about it. And I think also, like, um, things from, like, from, like, my experience, so I'm, I'm a new student this year, and, like, I've seen some things, but, like, the most, I don't know everybody, most of the people I know are, like, in my grade, um, I know a few 10th graders, a couple seniors. Um, it's like if I see something else, I, it's hard for me to be like, oh, I saw so-and-so doing this thing when I'm like, I don't know who that is. I just like see all these things happening, but I don't know like how to really, like, it's hard to put in like anonymous report because like I don't, even if I like, if, if I don't know like the names of the person, it's hard to like report something that's going on because I don't know who it is. So when, when teachers who are like around and see the same things don't do anything, then it falls on the students, but then like, I don't know who that is. There's just yeah. that kid in that class that I'm not in. <laughs> and so I think that's definitely a challenging about that. Those are good answers. And it gets back to, I think, Leo's point of empowering the teachers to take more action. Jeff, go, you can go ahead. <coughs> um, I'll, I'll wait. Yeah. Was somebody else? Speaking? No, go ahead. We went at the same time, but I, I, I'm still <laughs> formulating my, my questions. Okay. So you go. Um, <coughs> I have a couple things. One is, when you talked about microaggressions and like people going up and touching the student's hair, um, to me that's just rude. I mean, I wouldn't. I've known Karen for 20 years. I wouldn't just go up and touch her hair without asking her. It has nothing to do with her hair being a different kind of hair from what I'm used to. And I wonder how much one of the things that's needed. I don't know how this would happen, but it's like basic manners <laughs> yeah. and then it gets it gets exasper, exa ex exacerbated sorry when um you know when it does involve something like somebody not understanding that of course you shouldn't assume that because somebody is latin that they like salsa or whatever you know um so i, I it feels to me like somehow there may need to be education for students and teachers alike in how to set personal boundaries in a way so that if somebody comes and touches your hair, you have a way to say, I'm not comfortable with that without a, without starting something that becomes, then you get bullied for it or something like that. That feels to me like, and I think sort of the same along the same lines with discipline. I hear a lot about nothing happens or discipline as in punishment, but really, what, to, what needs to happen to create an atmosphere where people stop themselves from doing rude things because they have respect for other people? And that feels to me like there's a huge respect missing. Students towards teachers, people towards, you know, trans students towards, you know, people of color, students towards, and, and in my experience, both as an adult, observer of kids and as a kid myself it almost doesn't matter if there's nothing overt that's different a bully is still going to bully <laughs> so how do we how do we create rather than a punishment <coughs> that makes somebody just more resentful and 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 be meaner how do we somehow create an atmosphere where there's greater respect and a greater understanding of boundaries and and, and rudeness so actually, um, I'm going to answer your second question first. We do have something put in place. Last year, I had when I first moved here, I had food thrown at me, and I didn't know who anyone was. Mm. It was horrible, and this like little transactions kept on ha kept on happening between me and this other person. And so I, from day one, I would go to JK and I'd be like, I do not like this girl. No matter what you say, like I'm never going to ever like her. And then we finally got back to the investigation. It was investigated for the food, but it was weird because at the end of the day, <laughs> we did a circle. And she came out and she said, I was being an a-hole. And that was just me being me. It was none of your business. It was none of your fault. And we're on good terms now. Like, we don't have, I don't hate her. She doesn't hate me. And it was like, this monster taken off of my back because I was like, yeah, I did say things back to you and that wasn't right. I just wanted to get clarification. 
And I do think that's a good thing that we have put in place. But I also think that, you know, in this situation, it worked amazing, right? I haven't gotten bullied from that same person after that. And I think it's because we are peers and, you know, she's also in my grade. And I think that was like a mutual understanding. Like, we just want a senior year that's normal. We don't want any beef. We just want to be able to sit on the same bus for senior trip and take the same picture without having to, you know, you know, argue. And I think that that works, that is something that works really well, but can also work not very well. Like, it just depends on certain people. Just like how some learning types are really great for certain people. Some people love just sitting there and taking notes and then taking a test the day after. Personally, for me, I'm a hands-on learner. It's, I think it's just about what people are not comfortable with, but what they learn from. Yeah, and I, I think um, part of the reason it worked might have been that you set a boundary by talking to the adults about it and that resulted in something happening. And once you set that boundary, I suspect that she felt a different kind of respect for you because you set a boundary. Yeah. And I and I, 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 know, I just want to say one thing about investigations because I've, I've been involved with lots of school systems and I've seen situations where the investigation it becomes its own thing and it almost, I mean like, why are you investigating? Investigating, yeah, you want to, you want to get some facts, and you don't want somebody to get away with lying. <coughs> but we don't need to go into every who did this and was it your fault because you said that. And you're, you know, I've seen that like really almost bully the kids even more by the adults doing the investigation. So I sort of feel like sometimes beyond the minimum, moving out of an investigation quickly into some sort of getting communication and, and people talking about their limits and their boundaries and that stuff might be. And I totally agree with you. Um, on the same note, I think that investigations shouldn't take, we have a deadline for investigations unless it has to be pushed back, say, because the boiler broke or <laughs> um, we have a few snow days. Um, but I do, I agree with you on the fact that investigations shouldn't take a long time because then it gets just anxiety. But I also, disagree on the fact that we I think we should have investigations I think that's a big part of figuring out not blaming the students like who did this and why did they do that but figuring out what happened in the whole so the circ the person who does the circle or your counselor knows how it all started um, and I think that's a really big thing on like getting past old beef or drama um, because you can these the people around you know what happened and how you felt or what others seen from that situation. Um, on the other note, for your first question you had like a while ago, um, and I bet you want to answer this question too. I think that setting boundaries is an amazing thing. Um, and I think that that's, you know, it's a really good thing to learn. Um, but in high school, when you're working things out yourself, it's really hard unless you're an outgoing person to say, I don't like that like stop in front of a group of people. And I think that it's not, not only for, you know, kids like me and Sierra, but I think it's a lot to ask, you know, BIPOC students to call out, and LGBTQ students to call out these microaggressions when they happen. Because for me personally, when I was told the things that I was told, I didn't say anything. It was a teacher or even like a student. At first you're just like, you get that shock. You're like, whoa, you just said that to me? I don't, feel like we should pressure like shy students Absolutely or even BIPOC not. students I, to set these boundaries. I didn't mean to create yeah. that impression. It's not necessarily I'm saying in the moment you set that boundary necessarily, yeah. but that you find a way for you, it was going to the adults and yeah. then having the circle. Or I mean there are, but but that that the shy people and the the people who are who struggle with that are the ones who most need a lot of options for how to set boundaries. I'm not I'm not saying yeah. I just call out everything when it happens. I'm, yeah. It just makes chaos. Yeah. But, but just that, that the whole student body gets some options of how they can set boundaries and how the adults can help them do Yeah, that. and I totally agree with you with that. Yeah, yeah I definitely think um, that's a big thing. And like, um, I just want to talk about a couple notes. Um, so like, I think that like, when you're like talking about like <laughs> discipline, um, I feel like at least when, what I'm talking about discipline, I don't mean like, Okay, if you do this thing again, you're gonna get suspended from school. Are you gonna? Yeah. Th if you do this, like this many times, you're gonna get expelled. Not like 
that like hardcore you're gonna like those type of punishments but more like and maybe punishment feels like a the weird or like a weird word for that but like um I don't know like the right word but like figuring out how to um like contain these situations and have them not happen again um it's like that's sort of like what I'm thinking about when I think of like discipline um and then as far as like uh just like there's um, tend to be like a missing like respect just for some people um part of that like I think is a lot of just like lack of education and a lot of these instances of, of hate are just born from ignorance and um I think finding like finding ways in the school to just incorporate that so then the students who like that is happening to don't have to deal with it on their own and don't have to be the ones to come forward um well, I think that would be really beneficial if because it shouldn't all fall on those students to have to call out find teachers all of that it should just be already it needs a, to be a yeah. systemic way for everybody yeah. to yes. feel yeah. that they can figure out how to get treated with respect. Mm -hmm. And I, um, we've been learning something, and I've been learning something from JK. It's intent versus impact, and it has helped a lot. I Well, at least with me. I know that it's helped a lot of our seniors, too. And we've been trying to spread the word as much as possible. Because I don't think, when we hear things from teachers like that, I don't automatically think that teacher is racist. I'm not like, oh my gosh, that teacher is just downright racist, you know, confederate flat. Like, I'm not like that. It's more of like a... We are a small state. Are they educated? Look where they grew up. Look how they grew up. Look at this community. And look at how many educational things that you can find in Vermont about that stuff. Because there's very little. And I think that with the racial justice class, we're kind of trying to change that in the school. Um, we're trying to, like, you know, s try to teach these to the teachers and the students. And I think that's a big part is uh, I think, I think at least we understand is like, when we say like teacher said something that wasn't right, we're not like saying that that teacher is automatically racist, racist for the rest of their life. Obviously not. Um, something that I've been told a lot since I moved here because when I moved here, I didn't know a lot about the state and coming from a state with a lot of population and a lot more BIPOC students, it was weird hearing teachers say that and just like being no nonchalant. And I would go to my mom and be like, this teacher just, said this today and it was like out of nowhere um and my mom would be like they're not it's not because they're downright racist it's because they're not taught the same way that i was taught or the same way that she was taught because they weren't really there was no openings to teach um it's really hard for a white person to teach another white person on bipoc issues like i said and so i don't think it's about like this community being racist or this community being republican or whatever it is that everyone wants to say it is i just think it's because it's a small town, and we don't have a lot of students that are minorities. It's not a lot of diversity. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I definitely agree with all that. Um, it's just like just a lack of lack of awareness, lack of knowledge. <laughs> so I think this is um, a good segue to enter into our next round. Um, Did you have a question? Um, Go ahead. It was actually pretty similar to what you asked. I mean, I guess my question. I, I feel like it's I feel like it's pretty similar to what you asked. So I'll, I'll hold back. Okay. Um, you hear me talk. Uh, and this is, uh, we'll start with the student, and this uh, would definitely encourage community members to partake in this next round in conversation. But what are the ways, okay, so I'll, I'll share sort of the next three questions so that you can get your, your thoughts organized. What are the ways in which the school community can support students to feel safe in the building? What are the ways the community can support that effort? And then there's a question that I would like us all to, to consider, but like, what are actual action steps? What can be our next steps forward to provide that, that's, that feeling of security that something is being done so that the repeat offenders are, do not continue offending? Um, so again, what are the ways in which the school community can support students? Um, I had an interview with the RTCC members the other day, and, I, and they asked me that same question. And I think that for me and for my thought process, the way the community can at least help us in our school <coughs> is by parents not going against each other all the time. It's always 
one parent doesn't like this parent because this parent thinks of this political ideology and this one doesn't. I think that's what tears our community apart is that we're split right down the middle. And so at these forums, not this one, but at forums last year about the BLM flag, it was one side versus the other, this side versus that. Whenever this the locker room situation happened, it was this political ideology versus this. But instead of that thinking, I think the community, we should all come together and think about put all of that aside, put of all your beliefs aside and think, what is safe for our students right now? What is safe for them to be able to go to school and not think that something is gonna happen because the, there was a news outbreak all nationally and there was threats nat nationally around the country. And I think that that's something great, that's okay. That's great to think about because it's putting everything that you believe aside and coming together as one community because no matter what you think and no matter what you believe, your children are going to school together. Like, there's no way of getting past that. We're not splitting the school in half of who believes in this? Who's believe Let's do separate classrooms. Like, your kids have been in school together since kindergarten. They're going to be in school together unless you move until 12th grade. There's no this ands or buts about it. Um, I think that we really do need to just come together as a community and just put everything else aside. Um, from the school, I think the exact same thing. Students need to just put it all aside and think about something else because there is no, it's always I believe in this against I believe in that. And it's never going to work out. I think that we can have conversations about boundaries and we can have conversations about, hey, don't say that without bringing political ideology into it. There's okay way to set boundaries and be like, I don't like when you say that because it just makes me uncomfortable while being like, I don't like that you said that because you're a Trump fan and I don't like Trump. It's <laughs> you see how differently that sounds and how differently that could be taken into context and could be taken into consideration. Because if someone was like, I don't like you because of blank, because of this political ideology that you have, I probably wouldn't listen to them because they're just going against my beliefs just because that's that's the only reason why they hate me. But if they went up to me like, Layla, you're making me uncomfortable because that was really mean what you said me, to me earlier today. Um, I just didn't, that didn't make me feel comfortable in school. It's different from saying it made me uncomfortable because you're believing this, and it made me comfortable believe you and believe in that. And I think that's how we can get together with students and community. I think uh, definitely like there's like the whole thing about like common ground. Like all students are going to the school. All students have to you know deal with being with each other all day. There's going to be incidents, whether it's an instance of oppression with like a student part of a marginalized group or just two students are arguing at lunch over something that happened in class or you know something like that um that you know there there should be the common ground of just wanting all your students to feel safe i think also i mean this could go for like school community and just the rest of the community just have a willingness to learn and which is it's really hard it's really hard to accept that like something that you thought might not be beneficial to everybody in school or like might be hurting somebody and that's hard to admit that but I think when people are willing to actually learn then they can learn and learn from their mistakes and therefore like grow and be better in the future to not harm people in that way and I think that's something that a lot of people in the school are really having a hard time with and I think because so much of it is not talked about in like curriculum it's just all talked about in these outside instances and it's not like embedded in school and I feel like that's something like maybe having I don't know how like curriculum gets formed or whatever but having teachers and like admin like back curriculum changes in order to start um, putting these ideas into the school that will like make people be willing to learn and like accept new ideas um, and I think like definitely with students finding a common ground is good and something like you you may not you don't need to like like somebody or like their ideas but as long as you can just be like civil <laughs> in a school setting that's I think what people um, need to be able to do and obviously if there is an instance where somebody is you know using their um, like views against you then being able to report that is and having the school like back you and support you and that is really important um, to have.
I think it's fair to you know invite everyone into the conversation um, in these two rounds just thinking about um, based on what you've heard from the students what do you think that the school could be doing better to to make all students feel safe and maybe as community members what role do you have in supporting the school um, by attending these forums for example um, that show support of all students as well so that's kind of just a, a question for us all to consider before um, I'll slap another piece of paper up there to maybe talk about um, actionable steps I have a question so both of you kind of talked about how a lot of the issues from what I'm hearing are coming from like different sides or opposing views. Does the school, and you, you might, and I just don't know, does the school have a debate club where you could actually, these, the kids can be taught how to effectively communicate with one another and try to deliver their point of view without bringing in emotion or, you know, like solid evidence we do have a debate club it's not it's not about that though it the debate club from last year they wrote up an essay about something and debated it to judges to go on to the next round i don't think we have an actual debate club that's broadcasted just to learn about how to debate and how to you know come in and be like sierra this is why we don't agree on this and no emotions just these are my facts these are my you know these are the facts these are the resources your turn like we don't have that um if i if i can interject i feel like our teaching about those discussion like we have discussion norms that exist across classrooms like i know that these hang in my classroom uh to help frame discussions i think our avenue as opposed to debate looks like um the skills we build from seventh and eighth grade onward uh, to prepare students to participate in what we call like Socratic seminar. So the ability to ar like arrive at a conversation prepared with a claim, supported by evidence, and with like sound reasoning to continue the conversation so when there's a lull, I can interject my next idea or and do so very respectfully. Working with primarily 11th and 12th graders, I can say for certainty that like the groundwork is laid by my colleagues at grades seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11, so that when I am assigning a Socratic seminar, I have one tomorrow, I like I can sit back and with a you know pen and my student names, making sure that they hit the criteria for like how I want the discussion to run, and it is a fine-tuned machine. They have practiced, but it's also focused on their attitude towards Hemingway's novel. Do they <laughs> exhibit and showcase those same skills when it becomes a more politically or socially charged issue? No, and it seems that the parents of the community at times also lose their ability to like really hone those discussion skills um, when things become a really, really emotionally charged. Um, so there is a place for it that lives in our curriculum and I think that is actually quite well practiced. Um, but then I think, I think the situations that they're talking about don't exist in that very academic setting, right. but happen in hallways passing and in bathrooms and in the cafeteria where the structure falls away a little bit and then it's a super unsatisfying experience for students where they feel like nothing is happening. If, if there were, whether it's a debate club or, or, you know, something, if there were more formal within the school discussions of things like, like hot issues and, and trans issues and things, and this is maybe a question for you more than, how much do you think you would get backlash from the parents in those two sets of divisions? Is that, is that even doable in this day and age? And I'm, I'm saying that not about just just about the school, but the whole country, I and mean, that's where we're, can we do that? Can we have those conversations and not 
have teachers getting fired or, you know. I, I think that is a good question. Like, how do we do that and do it safely? Yeah. So that we're not causing more harm than good through this academic exercise. Um, and I feel like so many of these issues have become so politicized beyond like our wildest imaginations, if you asked me six years ago um, about this, that, that I think it is really hard to know what the first steps would be for that. Um, Katie may have a differing perspective, but I think you have to be so incredibly careful and not even, I mean, you mentioned teachers getting fired, but I think about kids for whom being a part of that conversation or being an audience to that conversation are more harmed than yeah. helped by yeah. that conversation. Yeah. yeah, I guess I would add that we used to, you know, I think we used to be very, and we still are, like deliberate in our purposeful planning and scaffolding up to something like that. So as JK was talking about, like using the Socratic seminar and being very mindful and aligned in the way in which we introduce the related skills, the research skills, the you know presentation skills, the ability to use some of what you're talking about in terms of debate and problem solving and the ability to pivot and transition um, and have those be safe topics. Like, you know, you start with like dogs versus cats and then you just kind of like work your way up. I always um, heard you just say dogs and I thought, you think that's starting <laughs> low? <laughs> no. <laughs> dogs. Dogs. Um, but I, I think as Lisa noted, I, I, it, it is, it was impossible for us to anticipate mm -hmm. <laughs> what the current climate is and 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 what that ability to pivot entails now is different than it used to be um, because now you're not necessarily on solid footing when you're introducing evidence to a conversation like that yeah. right yep um, and so I think it has led us to have to really re-envision and rethink how we do scaffold up yeah. to a conversation like that in a way that is safe and takes into account all of the perspectives of the individuals who are in the space together. <laughs> because now we're also having to be very mindful of the different experiences that our students and our educators have had that have led us to where we are. Um, and it's hard to, to, to calibrate and to really be able to, to feel that certainty that we're having a productive, safe academic discussion um, that is going to yield a really valuable learning experience for everyone. Yeah, I, in a school board meeting, I, I heard several different people at different times say, I don't believe in trans. And to a trans person, is that saying, what, you don't believe in me? It's like saying, I don't believe in right-handed, you know? <laughs> or I don't believe in tall. Like, if it's who somebody is, and somebody's beliefs are it doesn't exist, what do you even do with that? Yeah, so, go ahead. Um, I, <coughs> I think with that, it's not just about it's not just about people's personal beliefs on, you know, trans rights or, you know, LGBTQ rights. I think it's more about, you know, us all in high school going through that puberty point and going through that point of like, no matter who's in the locker room, we're all uncomfortable yeah. because we're yeah, all learning sure. and growing about ourselves. <coughs> and I think to parents and to what I think it's like, you know, a function goes off in your head where it's like, you know, I don't think these parents that aren't taught about it understand. And I think all that these parents hear is when their daughter comes home, and I'm not saying it's right, but when their daughter comes home and says, this trans student's in the bathroom and it's making me uncomfortable. It's like that light bulb that's like, 
it's not about like, oh, that other girl is in the bathroom. It's like as soon as it flicks on, it's like there's a guy in the bathroom. And even though they don't, you know, identify as a guy, that's what flicks on because your daughter just came home and said she's uncomfortable. This is a new day and age. This is a new learning. This is a new everything for anyone. Um, and I think that going through these things, and especially me being a senior and going through that as, you know, coming into ninth grade and having to change in the locker rooms in front of everybody at first, and I just see all these other girls, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, this is so uncomfortable. Like, I think that it's really hard for everyone in the locker room, and adding on this new type of learning that you need to, like, come into, and you need to, like, I, this new learning that a lot of people aren't taught about, it's really hard for parents to be like, I'm, you know, what is that? You know, like, all I know is that, yes, that she's trans, but she has different genitalia. And I think that's what comes up a lot in these conversations about the trans student being in the locker room is that she has different genitalia. And that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, not because, you know, I think things that are said can be transphobic, but I do think that it's because they're, they don't know because it is something new. Like these parents didn't go to school with people who were trans. Like, you know, it, you know, they're, they've learned about, you know, people being a part of the LGBTQ community, but trans is starting to become a very new and broad thing that's happening around the country. And I think that it's not just about beliefs and it's not about, oh, you don't believe in me, but it's also, you know, you gotta respect some people's religions. Um, last year we had a student named Muhammad. He was a foreign exchange student. He was an amazing student. He seen both sides of every story, no matter what. Um, Mr. Kelman had him in his class, and we always had discussions about things in AP US history. Like, what is this, and why is it? You got like a Socratic seminar. And it was more detailed, though, because it was AP US history, so we did talk about, you know, um, Native Americans and, you know, people coming over. And one of the things that we talked about, me and Muhammad, inside of like a group was, how, like, how do you learn about trans? Because in his country and in his religion, that's not a thing. Not because they're <coughs> transphobic, because that's the beliefs that they were built on. And I don't think it's about them being like, I think some things can be transphobic, but I don't think like these really Christian and Catholic and beliefs are spread across every, to every Christian and Catholic person. Um, but hearing from Muhammad saying like, yeah, trans people are cool. I just, you know, personally, I don't believe that that is from, if they were Muslim, I wouldn't believe that they were Muslim because that's a part of my belief. And I don't think it's about, I don't think you should tell people that in public. If you do believe that, I don't think you should go up to a trans person and be like, I don't believe you, sorry. But I think you should keep that to yourself. But at the same time, when these parents, I think, when I think about it is like, when I think about these parents and obviously I'm, I've talked to Amity and I have a lot of trans friends. It's, I just learned about it last year when I moved here. Um, but I think that when these parents hear that, that's all they hear is like, there's another dude in the locker room, is there's a dude in the locker room. Even though it's not what they think, it's different. It's just caught on that way. And it makes it this more uncomfortable thing of like, I have to learn about this. Like this makes me uncomfortable because I've never had to learn about this. And I don't know a lot of trans people, you know? And it's just like, I don't want to say they're forced into the setting of having to learn and grow, but they're forced into the setting of having to learn and grow. It is probably good learning to learn how to like deal and cope without being transphobic and to be like, this is a true thing. Like this is what people believe and this is what people are. Um, but being able to learn how to respect other people's beliefs without being like going, going to the news and spreading it across America that all these lo like it's, I think that we did, I, not to defend anybody, but I do think it's about like not not them believing in that person, but them not knowing or their beliefs on religion or their beliefs growing up were different. And I think it's really hard to learn out of religious and you know beliefs that you know as a kid. I'm just going to for the sake of our time, which is do we have a time end time seven o'clock? Okay. Um, to think about like refocusing our our brainstorming mm -hmm. on action steps. Um, so as you were talking, I was and Sierra, some of the things that you've mentioned um, have been just like you know, ignorance breeds fear and hate, 
Um, so raising awareness for our students so that they, again, can learn not to make the same offenses over and over again. Um, teacher, I, I can wholeheartedly say that I think teachers are resistant to interjecting their voices for the same reasons you've mentioned. If we don't have a relationship with, I teach primarily 11th and 12th graders, if I hear something of a middle school student, like I am also playing a, a fine, you know, like doing the fine dance of like, okay, like when I interject, this is going to establish our relationship. So like, what does that look like? Because I'm either like going to be hated the rest of the time the student is here, or this is a like a chance for learning. And I think that just in the moment, if I'm still debating that, I might have missed my teaching moment as I'm like playing that out. Um, and I think teachers need more tools. I can say going through a master's program that like to be equipped to deal with microaggressions is like an add-on that has been part of not my curriculum 12 years ago, but from like the last five years. And you can either attend those PDs or not. You have to choose to want to learn and protect your students and raise your voice and interrupt the behavior. And it's easier to close your door and focus on your classroom. Um, and then of course for parents, like I brought this tool tonight um, and I had thought about and had talked to the administration like months ago um, to like offer this tool as a way for community members also to reframe their thinking before interjecting in a board meeting, a community forum, the superintendent's forum, et cetera. Um, because I like, I'm ready and willing to have these tricky conversations with my students. Um, but th like they, I, I'm hoping that this is a tool for them too, to not immediately jump at the first initial response, but to think about it, to see where it lands on this mental map for them and for it to be a tool so that they are, if they choose to say in this community, like functioning and civil members of the community that you know, might have their kids come to school here someday and contribute to the forums the way you all are today. So, um, you know, raising awareness for parents too, just reminding them of discussion norms um, and then approaching these conversations, especially when we get to hear from our student volunteers with like a curious growth mindset so that we can learn about the school and just be in the practice of learning. Does anyone else wanna offer any ideas for action steps? So I have a, a couple of thoughts and they are also some questions that are kind of woven together. Um, are you all in, involved in doing any kind of bystander training at all on the, in, in the school? Where you um, help students to understand how to, if I'm a bystander and I'm seeing something happen, what can I do? Has anybody been given that set of tools at the school? Not in a very long time. So I think bystander training can be really, really helpful for a community if you are all in agreement that that part of the challenge for students is how do you hold one another accountable? How do you all have your own responsibilities to hold each other accountable? But then the same thing for the teachers, right? You know, and the administrators. Bystander training can help you too. So if as a community in the high school, you all go through that, and I appreciate uh, what Sierra said about curriculum, right? Curriculum can really make a difference. It doesn't have to be in-classroom curriculum, but it can be, you know, extracurricular curriculum that kind of helps people understand what <coughs> that means. So I think, I think bystander training is important. Then having difficult conversations training is also, I think, really important. And I'm not sure if you've all done that here in some elements or not. Um, but that's something that you can take to your students, to your faculty and staff. But then also, that, these are the kinds of training opportunities you can also do at community forums for community members, too. Um, but it looks like you have your hand. Yeah, um, I was actually going to say that student uh, campus life was actually trying to plan or getting ready to plan. I know I talked to you about this, about doing like an anti-bullying assembly or a bystander assembly. 
And I know because a lot of schools do do it. Like my school in Georgia, we had assembly at least twice a year about bystanders and bullying. And we had guests come in. And, you know, some of the guests were like, not famous, but they like did cool things. And they were like, I was bullied once. And then everyone would be like, yeah, that's cool. Like, let's not bully people because look at who's been bullied. Like this cool, <laughs> awesome guy that can do skateboard tricks has been bullied. And I think it's like we should do that too. Like have like maybe like an assembly where the whole school gets together and be like, here's an anti-bullying thing, and then kind of incorporate, not hands-on, but some fun stuff in it. So it's not like, oh, I got to go to this anti-bullying assembly today. I'm just going to fall asleep or be on my phone. And so it's like kind of like an in-between where it's like an anti-bullying assembly and not like a prep rally, but kind of like a let's bring everyone together and talk about this really hard issue. I love what you're what you're saying because it's focusing on like positives and I think that's where change can really come is when you start to see a pathway to to something better, right? And so if we if being part of raising awareness and 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 having something um, and teaching people, it's not just about each individual thing, but why do you want to have a good community? Why do you want to have like uh, you know, good feelings between different people. And like, if we could help people to have that motivation to have good community and uh, good will for one another and just beautiful feelings for each other. And like, so I don't know if that's like bringing in motivational speakers and painting a picture somehow for everyone to see what that would feel like. But they start to begin to, because they need to have that motivation before they can even want to learn to be different, you know. There needs to be a reason. So, uh, yeah, I love what you're saying, the positive, yeah. Yeah, just building off of what you're saying, Karen, you know, I think, I, I was wondering, kind of hearing some of this conversation of, like, do are there ways we need to find to do a better job of sort of <clears throat> not just thinking about how do we deal with transgressions as they arise, but articulating where the line is both on the like really micro level in our classrooms but also on the macro level like in our community and our district and I think part and parcel of that is also like like yeah well, how can we make more opportunities and kind of more ways of expressing what our common values are and baking that into more of our community events um, so they're not just like words at the beginning of the handbook um, but yeah and I think that yeah so that they be, can become things that we refer to as we are you know providing rationale for why we are doing things as a school you know I was, I was thinking about like you know the, sort of the issue of, of people who are uncomfortable with transgender people being in the same spaces them um, or questioning their existence and, and sort of thinking about like to me it's very much the same principle that we apply to students who come from different faith backgrounds right which is like yes of course you get to be Muslim Mormon you know Jewish atheist whatever at school we're not going to debate that aspect of your identity you know and and, and so um, because I what I what I see as kind of what you were talking about, the, the politicization of, of so much of, you know, our society. Um, yeah, it makes it really hard. I, I think it makes it, like, as someone who's trying to teach students about anything, I, I teach social studies, so, like, double whammy there, that, that like, the, the, without, like, a clear sort of, um, com like, collective articulation of, where those lines are and where those goals are, it's hard to feel empowered to do anything that might be risky. And at this point, that could be anything. So I think, I think like, I see that as really urgent because I, th I think that um, otherwise, whatever becomes political becomes off limits. And that leaves us in a place where we're not actually teaching kids what they need to know, you know, and we're not. We're not even teach. We're not even asking the questions that they need to think about, right? Even you know, regardless of, of the answers we're providing them. Can I just say, I, I when you're you've been talking this evening, um, I hear a great willingness on your part to be understanding of where people are coming from, 
And when I think about, for instance, and, and you know, well, the, the um, locker room issue, you know, right away from the beginning, the language that was being used was there's a man in the locker room. It's a girl's locker room and a 14-year-old man. And, but the parents who heard that, all they care about is their kid's safety. And they hear there's a man in the locker room and the rest of it doesn't even matter. How do they get, how can they get past the fear that, that you have? Because you want your kids to be safe. These parents are wanting the very best for their kids. And some of the way that that happened prevented them from hearing what they need to hear because ignorance does lead to fear. In addition to which in this community we've had some pretty traumatic stuff happen where kids were not safe and it became publicly clear that kids have not always been safe um, and um, I think that, that that also contributes to that instant reaction when, I, when, when people hear there's a man in the locker room and that we need to be able to address that. Yeah, I think um, definitely like being able to like yeah like have these like hard conversations where people yeah. are willing to just like talk about it and like learn is very yeah. important yeah um and i think another thing that like as far as like action steps go um as there is you know talk of a like equity policy being put in place that like might require some teacher like more teacher trainings on how to deal with these things how to like open up these conversations to students and all that i think like something community members could do is like Sh sh show support for that. So it is clear that many people in the community want something like this to happen and making that support known um, so it's can actually, something like this can actually be put in place. Yeah, and I, yeah, I agree with you. And on our personal account, like being someone who has to be on both sides can be very positive and it's very <coughs> good for you. Um, I, it was very good for me. So as Campus Life President and you're throwing these events for everyone, you kind of have to be on like the middle of both views of people when you're told things. Because as soon as you say, I agree with Amity, boom, half the school doesn't want to go to your events. They're, they are miserable at pep rallies because they know Campus Life supports one side over theirs. So as Campus Life members, I have told my members like the first meeting we've ever had or like a few after, I told, I was like, I sat them down and I was like, if you say anything about anything that happened that is negative, and if you respond to anyone with a negative intent, no matter if it's Blake, no matter if it's Amity, no matter whoever it is. Let's try not to use Oh, sorry. Him. Yeah. No matter if it's either side of the story, like you're automatically out because I understand both sides, right? Like I don't think the things that. Focus on action yeah. steps. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that we as a school need to just be together as a community because it gets really hard when we're not, and it gets really hard in school when you have to wonder, like, who is coming to the school today and who is threatening us, you know, because it, it, especially nationally, um, I think an action step is to just, I know you guys try to keep it on the down low, like when things happen obviously because it can strike fear but I also on the other hand think that you guys should maybe email the parents a little bit more when things like that happen like oh hey guys today we had to like shut down our phone lines because <laughs> you know we were getting a little and not so like parents don't have to hear from their kids and then it's like their kids say something completely different that's like kind of on the same track that they heard from another friend that that friend heard a teacher talking about and <laughs> it's just like a whole line of things and since we're such a tight-knit community it's really hard to when you hear something it's kind of like the game telephone. It's like you hear something and then you try to mimic it back. And it's exactly what it is in this tight-knit community because everyone has connections to everyone. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it gets out to one person, it gets out to ten. And then, then it's just it's just full on out by then. And I think like one of those things is like communicating with parents more and trying to tell students in like a, like not in a better tone, but trying to tell students like not everything, obviously, but trying to tell students like, you know, this happened, but do it in like a way where it won't strike fear, right? Because then if you don't tell them and it like comes out, it strikes more fear. Um, after school, we were here after school for theater auditions and we heard that there was a lockdown 
and we all thought that it was just a bear outside per usual, but it was actually someone coming into the school or trying to come into the school or something. We heard from Vine. We're in the theater room for 10 minutes. Like, is it a bear? Like, um, I got pushed out of a room with windows. So then I was like, oh, God. Like, I was texting my mom. It was, cr I, that was the most fear I've ever had in this school because of the unknown, right? And the being of like, is it a bear or since we're like on this national TV, you know, and we're on this national thing, is it a shooter? Like, what is this? Because we are a public school and it is, I don't want to say it's getting more common, but it's more easy to do bad things. So I think that having that, you know, balance of being like, trying to say it safe, like say it like, this is what's happening right now and trying to communicate more when these things happen. I think things that are communicated to parents should also be communicated to students. Because I know a lot of emails that go out from the school just go to the parents. A lot of emails from like admin, superintendent, all of that just go to parents. So for example, that time in the theater, um, we didn't know what was going on. And I guess they sent an, e like, an email was sent to parents being like, oh, this was a thing where like taking safety precautions, but like, you know, we'll update you soon. Everything should be fine. We never got that email. So like I was relying on you texting your mom, like trying to figure out what was going on because we never got that email. Yeah. And so then I didn't find out the full story until like I got home and I was able to like hear what my dad like with the email that he got. So I think a lot of that thing also just isn't communicated to students. And I think sometimes it's thought of as like, well, we should protect our students or like, you know, keep them out of it. It's not really to worry, but like it's our school. We're in the school. And if things are being told to parents, we should also know what's going on. And be and have that same communication because it is the school we are in and our environment. I reflect that what I'm hearing from Layla is uh, and from Sierra both is a desire for transparency, and that's that's really important, right? I mean, and there's we all know that there's a certain set of things that can't be communicated, but you know nobody is hurt by over communication. Like you might be like, oh gosh, Lisa and Katie are sending another email. Okay. But then you read it, right? Nobody's hurt by that. What we are hurt by is if we don't have information, right? Because then that has people speculate and, and fill in the blanks and the gaps in their own way, whether it's from one point of view or another point of view or from personal experiences, right? And so my advice for an action plan is over communicate. And I agree with you. I think that when parents get calls from their kids saying like, we're in lockdown, the teacher doesn't know what's happening, it's after school, like, like we said earlier, like that's all they hear. And then it's like a, oh my gosh, I have to go to school, like especially with everything happening, like I don't know how my mom felt, but I know she was like, what, Layla, what? And like the data was kind of bad, so the messages were getting in late, and then I was like, mom, like I don't know what's happening. So it was like miscommunication all over, and then my mom, like I bet she was like, she was filled with anxiety. Like she called me like a million times, but I didn't get it because the data, and it was just, like you said, like just miscommunication. And it really, really is hard for students and teachers because I was in an adrenaline rush. I was like talking to her. I was like, we got to get out of here. Like, what are our exit plan? Like, what are we going to do? Throw a chair. And then my mom's calling me and I'm not getting it through. And all she's thinking is like, oh my God, my daughter just said they're in lockdown. Now she's not calling me back. Like there's something wrong. And I think that that's, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I have a question. Um... I, a, a lot of these action steps are great. I love the anti-bullying assembly idea and the bystander training. I mean, all of it are really good ideas. I just, I kind of want to know, coming from, like, this is our second year here, so the restorative circle process is new. Like, never heard of it before until we moved here. How... How effective are they? And for those repeat offenders, like there has to obviously, if there's issues going on in the school, there's going to be repeat offenders that are going to these circles that are coming out and doing the same thing again. What is, is there a set kind of like consequence, like order that's going to happen after a restorative circle? Because also, back to what um, this lady was saying earlier about, you know, shy kids maybe not being able to set boundaries. I would not want to set boundaries if I knew that they were going to go to a restorative circle, come out, go to a restorative circle, and come out, and they're still here. Like, I wouldn't say anything. Um, 
So I'm just wondering how effective are they and if there is, you know, and it's known through the students and the faculty what happens to these students if they are not, you know, I don't want to say rehabilitated, but you know, if they don't come out on the positive end a after these meetings. Yeah, I think, um, I think what we can say is that there has to be a willingness from the students to engage in that intervention. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's never going to be anything compelled by the school to say, this is a part of the consequence. You have to engage in the restorative circle because it's not restorative <laughs> if that is the case. And our desire is never to set up a situation that causes more harm. And if the students are not willing to engage in that intervention, there is that potential. Um, the restorative process is separate and apart from the disciplinary okay. process. So the disciplinary process would happen regardless, oh, right? Okay. Um, and then the restoration is something that we facilitate upon the willingness of the participants to engage in it. And then we're really thoughtful about who is there. And I'm sure JK will add more to this because she's facilitated a lot of our circles um, because that piece is incredibly important too. Mm -hmm. Who's in the room, you know, not only, you know, the willing participants to be there, but also the people who they may identify as people they'd like to be there to be supportive. And then we have to go through kind of a vetting process there too because again, we need to make sure again that that dynamic isn't thrown off by any one person being kind of added in, right? Right. Um, you think about how many people should be there. Should it be you know, a larger circle with more voices? Should it be um, a circle that's smaller and more contained because of what you're sharing in terms of what we know of the student who may have more anxiety heading into that process? Um, and who that support person could be for them in order for them to feel like they're really able to share and kind of heal in the process. Um, so I think as you can hear me, you know, think out loud with you, Stacy. Mm -hmm. it's like there's a lot to it right. um, to ensure that it's actually going to be healing and not harmful. Um, and we would rather just not do it if there's any doubt in our minds that it could lead to more harm than good. But yeah, I'll let you I, add to that and you, Lisa. Yeah, I, I wanted to just say, you know, the circles aren't really about changing kids' opinions or thoughts or ideas. It's about um, really understanding where the common ground is, really understanding each other's perspective and having a conversation about how we restore our community here at school. Um, one of the things that happens in advisory as kids move up um, through the grades is they take part in circles um, at least a couple times a month, a circle where they have prompts often once a week in advisory um, so that when things get hard, they already have a mental model for how to sit in a circle, listen to each other, <coughs> hear each other's perspectives, and um, and just repair the sense of community that they, they might want to be looking for. I mean, I appreciated what Layla said earlier in this conversation about having that circle and like being able to be on a bus or in a senior picture together and being okay with each other. Um, that, that feels really important. And to your point about repeat behavior after restorative circles, they are incredibly effective. Um, so when all sides come to the table and they're ready to have a conversation, um, I was trying to think about it and I can't think of a time when the behavior has been repeated. Oh wow, okay. I have a question. How, how is that taught to the students? Like how do they learn about the, the restorative process? And um... Well the restorative process isn't, I mean it's, so it's restorative that word's right in the name. Um, so you have to have a sense of community to restore. Um, and so what we work on in advisory is building the community and having conversations 
and creating the structure so that they know how to have the conversation in a circle. Um, and then when things get hard and we have to have a restorative conversation, that foundation is already there. So it's like a separate, like it's not a school-wide assembly, but they learn about it in their own little... Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, in the past, we have had restorative justice PBLs where students have learned how to be facilitators. Mm -hmm. We haven't run that in a few years, but it might be time mm -hmm. to run one of those again. Yeah. And the students were trained, the teachers were trained. Mm -hmm. and... I know we're, we're running out of time, but I just want to, my suggested action is a lot of good things are on here. It feel like, feels like it needs to come together in a policy of some sort. I don't think it's a board level policy. It feels like it needs to be more detailed and specific, so I don't know if it's an admin policy, but my suggestions would include some sort of way to ask the teachers to be more accountable in these situations. And obviously teachers need support, both with the tools around the training, but also I've heard in previous community forums, it hasn't come up tonight, but they need support from admin and school board that they're gonna be supported if they implement the policy and, and, and address some of these microaggressions. I don't know if there's a policy already in place that just maybe needs some updating for what we've learned tonight, but um, I'd be interested in hearing from admin on like who, who would own that and who would call up on that. And teachers and students need to be involved in that as well. Actually, the racial justice class, we were talking about like being in on trying to like help make this policy because we just learned about it the other day that like there was a policy that was going to happen and we did this whole board like on the board where we put all of our ideas on this board and we, Mr. Cummins said, okay, now let's put the more realistic ideas and the more ideas that are like in our dream reality and then let's circle these together and see what can we do to make this dream reality come true. And I think one of our top things was an equity policy and was teacher training and student teacher training. Um, so yeah, I think, I think all of that could be included in that type yeah. of policy. And I think that's, I don't know where that is in the works, but it's in theory in the works. So I think like trying to like get in on that is good. I think it's yep. Yeah, thank seven you. Seven o'clock on the nose. We really appreciate your participation. We can't thank you all enough for being here, and particularly our student panelists. Thank you so much for generating questions and for us to probe this topic tonight. And we're going to continue this conversation. So thank you for the action steps. The next steps we have. We have a lot to think about and a lot to implement um, and put into place as a result of what was generated here tonight. So really, thank you so much for your engagement, engagement tonight and your participation in the conversation.